fix our eyes on Jesus for a little bit and continue our study of the book of Hebrews. I kind of briefly asked these questions last, last week, right after our uh, voters meeting, but I'll ask them again. What is the tabernacle a pattern of, or a copy of? Remember that? From chapter, uh, from chapter 9. This is your Sunday school answer. It's a pattern or copy after Jesus, who is the true, who is the true temple, the true presence of God. Remember the destroy, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up. From uh, from John's gospel, but he spoke of the temple of his body. If it is a pattern copied from an original, where is the original? This was my. Uh, um, are you a Lutheran question, which Walt so graciously failed for me last week. If it's a pattern copy from an original, where is the original? Another way of asking that question is, where is Jesus? Everywhere? Well, true. That's not ultimately the answer here. Deaconess? We're two or three are gathered together as more specific. present specifically by his word and spirit where he promises to be found. Baptism, the word, the Lord's Supper. All right. Now, let's go on to chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, special bonus for anyone who can uh, tell me what lent him this uh, this verse four comes out of. What this uh, this verse has a uh, specific lent him. One sixty eight in TLH. All the, not all the blood of goats on Jewish altars slain. Yeah, not all the blood of goats. On Jewish yeah. altar slain. Yep. So, so this is a this is a, a section here in Hebrews that that is often referenced during during Lent. So, so what what are some of those other words that we've had very similar to shadow? We have we got shadow here. I said some of them just a little bit earlier. Type, type is another one that we get. What's a type? You know that sort of thing. We get shadow, type, pattern. Copy, preview. That would be an interesting, I would, I'll have to test that, that analogy to see if preview, uh, if preview actually sort of works, where you get sort of a, uh, a sneak peek into something, where you don't get the whole, the whole thing, but you are getting, getting a, little, a little glimpse into it. Something, uh, something along those lines. I'll have to think on, think on that one a little bit. So, so the basic point of this, though, is that the shadow can't do the work of the reality without the reality, right? <laughs> if there's no, if there's no coffee cup, there's no shadow behind the coffee cup, right? <laughs> and so the only way that all of these sacrifices make a lick of sense in the Old Testament is if Jesus is coming. Because he is the, not the shadow, but the real, the real thing. The real deal that's coming behind it. Okay? And, and this kind of, I, I had a couple people ask me last week afterwards um, to sort of explain the tabernacle thing again. 
And, and so I'm going to try to do it here for a second, and, and uh, we'll see what level the brows are furrowed <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of this, okay? There are two basic ways, I would argue, of looking at the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? One way, which, while has some truth, ultimately doesn't quite pull it off, is to say that the Old Testament is, is kind of the thing. This is it. This is how God intended for these things to work, to be done. But because the people messed it up, Jesus had to come and kind of finish the job. Okay? And, and I would argue that most Christians tend to think in those terms. That why did Jesus have to, come, have to come? Well, because all of this temple and sacrifices and stuff, we just couldn't, we, we didn't have enough sort of gumption or get up and go to do it right. And if we had done it right, then, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come, even. And now you're a Seventh-day Adventist. That is exactly right. So that's kind of one, one approach. The other is, is to say that Jesus was always the point, start to finish. Jesus was always the point, he was always the plan, he was always God's intention. Jesus is not an afterthought or sort of a, a, a divine band-aid to come in and fix something that got messed up later. But that, but that Jesus is always the intention and that these things in the Old Testament are shadows, patterns, types, foreshadowing. That is, that they point us to something that's coming. Some greater, greater reality. And that the only way to get to, get to, to understand the Old Testament, finally, is to understand Jesus. Because without that, you don't have the key to unlock it. Dennis? Um, he was the divine plan A, and there was no plan B. And there was no B. Yeah, this is, this is God's, God's intention and purpose all along. So, that's a, I, would, I would say an extremely important thing to kind of get as we're trying to wrap our brains around this really pretty complex book. Set. Does that, both of these theories, mean after the first couple of chapters of Genesis, or? Well, that, is, that too is a really good question, um, which probably goes beyond the scope of the next half an hour, <laughs> but, but I, I have actually sort of hinted at that question a few times here. Um, we're going to get to that a little later in Hebrews, but the question is, would Jesus have come if Adam and Eve had not sinned? Okay, so there's my question. Would Jesus have come into the flesh if Adam and Eve had not sinned? And that is a really interesting question. Because what that means, and there's a lot of sort of layers to that question. Um, but, uh, and I'm not going to answer it for you right now. <laughs> Just not. But we can talk about it a little bit, though. But it doesn't seem to make any sense. There wouldn't have been any need or reason. Okay. Somebody that, else would have sinned. <laughs> somebody else would have sinned. Yeah, there you go. If it hadn't been Adam and Eve, it would have been, it would have been their grandchildren or great-grandchildren or somebody else. Fair enough. I'll, 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 I'll grant you that one. But that does, and, and you, you've exactly hit upon kind of the, the real heart of that question, is, is the only reason that Jesus came to earth to forgive sins. Does Jesus have a purpose or point outside of our salvation? Hmm. Well, but he was here when he was created, so... Uh, he, he is the word. He is the word. He, is, he exists, you know, remember, begotten of the Father from eternity. So 
So it's not, again, it's not like Jesus is a backup plan or something. Oh, wait a minute. There's only me and the Holy Spirit. Because Adam and Eve sin, we better have a third person in the Trinity to fix it. That, no, no. But that's a, and that is a really tricky question. I, I mean, it really is because there is so much in the scriptures when we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity and who Jesus, who Jesus is, and everything, and everything that goes along with that, that is going to sort of demand an answer to that. That is not. Uh, I promise that we will answer it. Don't, don't get me wrong, Dennis. Does Jesus have to have a purpose? He's, he is who he is. I mean, <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, and we always want to place a purpose. On yeah, it. yeah, we are, and maybe that's our sort of American pragmatism uh, kind of coming out. Is that if he doesn't have a if he doesn't have a purpose, then it must be useless, and you must you might as well toss it out. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Dennis. Great question. That's the throw. Welcome home, Froze, by the way. <laughs> after all of your travels and travails, we have been uh, keeping. Keeping you in prayer very much Thank this, you. Uh, this fall because yeah, I know you've had, had yeah. yeah, you've had an interesting fall. I was kind of expecting Jan to see you in a tent. You know, <laughs> 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 I believe it. I believe it. Pastor Frog, please. Since, since the Son is the way the Father creates, <clears throat> yes, um, the Son is also, according to John, the way the Father recreates. Yes. And um, to, to delve into that which Paul says in Romans is the secret things of God. Um, I, I don't think it's our place to do that. God's foreknowledge, in his foreknowledge, God knew the failure of Adam and Eve. Sir? Nevertheless, in his mercy, he creates with the plan of salvation already in mind. Right. So, and, and recognizing fully the cost to yeah. him. So, so, so I would argue that to, to discuss the question that was raised is to think after man's thoughts rather than to think after God's thoughts, which is be still and know that I am God. Okay. Which I think, if I can, uh, if I can interpret your pastor ease here, um, which I think is kind of the same thing that Dennis was saying, and that is that that we don't have to we don't have to kind of uh, ascribe absolute per, ab absolute purpose and, and sort of practicality to all of these little minutia because why because we're not God and, and you know let me. Let me take one little parallel on this, and then I promise we'll get back more specifically to the text. Um, families don't have vision statements or, or mission statements, right? I mean, it, has your, have you as a family sat down and said, okay, we're going to have a, we're going to develop a family vision statement? Maybe you have. I don't know. It's called the last will. It's called the last will and testament. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm really not, I'm not saying this to, to, make, to make fun of vision statements or anything. But a family is its own purpose. <laughs> Has its own kind of life inside itself. Why, we, why are you a family? Because that's who God made us. <laughs> we are a family because that is how God has given, has, has created us and given himself to us. And, and while we do all kinds of things, I don't have to kind of wrap it all up into a, into a little one sentence statement in order for it to be true. Right. Anyway, Andy. I was almost kind of scared before we even mentioned the family's admission statements. I was thinking of the thunder statement that would say, Does Jesus, or Jesus doesn't need a mission statement. <laughs> Jesus doesn't need a mission statement. It's an interesting point, just because, and I think that that's always our, our tension as a church, is to want to, to, want to quantify every everything that we are and do. And, uh, and, and sort of on the other side of that, you have, be still and know that I am God along the way. All right, 
I'm going to move on because, uh, well, because I think Hebrews is going to open up all sorts of other interesting doors. Consequently, verse 5, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a, but a body you have prepared for me. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. That's his mission. There you go. That's his, that's his uh, if, if, I suppose if you wanted a mission statement or kind of a little, what does, what does Jesus do? I have come to, I have come to do your will. And, and I think we could even say that he is the expression of the will of God in the world. Something along those, something along those lines. So if I want to know what God's will is, finally, for man, I look to Jesus, who says, "I have come to seek and to save the lost," etc. Which is really, which is really a uh, a very, uh, a, a really interesting way of thinking about who Jesus is. I like that. <coughs> When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right, now this furrows my brow, so I'm sure it will furrow yours. <clears throat> so we have to unpack this a little bit. So when he said, you have neither desire nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, <clears throat> he does this, he does away with the first, that is the sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, in order to set up the second. And the second is the body of Jesus, who is offered once for all. So this is another way of describing this. All of these things were, were patterns, were shadows, that, you know, if I move, <laughs> if I move the cup around, the shadow is going to move, right? <laughs> and so these, these shadows, these these. These uh, things that are patterned, these copies, <clears throat> these things finally are done away with. Not because they're evil, obviously. Remember, God is the one that set this up, but because they're no longer necessary, because you've got, because you have Jesus in the flesh. So they are no longer, so they're no longer necessary. They're they're obsolete. Did that make sense? Okay, I get a, I got a few furrows still. That's okay. Well, well, this is to me where a type comes in. He's a different type. He's a different type of sacrifice. The way that I would put it is a a type. A type is based on and. And you get this weird, this weird world word every so often called an antitype, not antitype, like I'm against the type, but an antitype. That is the thing that came before it. All right. So Jesus is the reality, the antitype. Then we get these types, these copies, these patterns or shadows. And when Jesus comes into the flesh, I no longer need any of these things. They're no longer necessary. Does that make sense? Am I a heretic yet? Okay, just checking. Dennis and then Pastor Frog. Just the idea behind Jesus coming was, was for the Jews, it was a, a way of simplifying his purpose. It brought to mind all the things they were doing before over and over and over. Right? That never took away sin. I mean, he steps in and does it once for all. Right. And, and at that point, that foreshadow disappears, and, and the true nature of God is revealed. Is revealed. Yeah. And that's the word made flesh, that, that 
same, that same kind of language. And, and I don't want to skip over this, this right here, because this is really is kind of the, this is the, this is the money part here. <laughs> this, this is the, this is the key. Is is that Jesus offering his sacrifice, his giving of himself, happens once for all. So it's not that 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 the that the old sacrificial system was was evil, but that it is no longer necessary. It is obsolete. Why? Once for all. So I, I never have to ask the question, did, did Jesus die for this sin? I knew he died for yesterday's sins, but did he die for this? Or even will he die for the stuff I do tomorrow? <laughs> and the answer is, once for all. That means all people, that means all sin, that means all time. Okay? All of those, all of those together. And what that means is this is the this is kind of the, the beautiful therefore that we get in Hebrews. Therefore we can enter into God's presence with joy. Why? Because we have been sanctified. We have been made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that and that, that holiness, that sanctification takes place once for all. It's, ne it's not a until or unless or a, or a uh, I always think of uh, the Flintstones when I think of this picture. This is you remember the Flintstones, right? Yeah. Of course, of course you remember the Flintstones. Yabba dabba do. This is a this. There is no gabba. There is no yeah, but what about this? This is the reality. I know it doesn't make sense. Just stay with me here. So that's so. So this is once for all. I keep uh, I keep thinking about uh, about scripture verses and sort of how we could highlight them and use them and use them around here uh, more. And this is one of those verses that uh, that that kind of makes me think. I'd like to have this you know plastered up on a, on the wall somewhere. Jesus, the the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That that. All people, all sin, for all time. And it's all encompassing. I think you referred to it in your sermon this morning about Jesus' assessment of John, that he was, in fact, the greatest of all the prophets. Yes. And when we normally think about that, we think about Old Testament, right, the end of prophets, in one sense, right, because they all pointed to something. Yep. And once that something was present, uh, John fulfills that, for example, Isaiah, uh, when, he, when he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And um, so in this respect, I think Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, is telling us that very statement that yep. you've articulated. Behold Jesus the Lamb Christ, of God, once for all. Once for all, who takes away the sin of the... Uh, World. And 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 the the disciples are called even greater than John, not because of their personal faith, because we know they they yeah, got they they definitely messed up on that, that one greater too. Model. But but because they saw the reality, which is the resurrection of Christ, who has overcome sin, Satan, death. Yeah, you got it. That's, that is exactly right. We're moving on. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. 
waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There's another verse. What? Isn't that a nice one? For by a single offering, that is, the offering of himself, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And, of course, we've been talking about that word perfected all fall, right? What does, what does perfected mean here? The perfected doesn't simply mean without fault. Completed. Completed. Finished. The, the purpose is now complete. This whole, this whole thing. So he has com completed, <laughs> perfected for all time. There's that, there's that once for all, again, for all time, those who are being sanctified, those who are being made, made holy. So there is no yabbats. <laughs> there is no, now all you have to do is this. Yeah, I love, I love that language just because uh, it's such a final statement, but it's also those who are being sanctified. Mm -hmm. I know, you know in the Christian yeah. life, it, it, the struggle against sin is so discouraging, yep. and it's, it, it feels very futile, you know, Absolutely. as decades pile on decades. Yeah. You know? Um, nope. And yet, and yet we have so there's so much comfort in that. Yeah, yeah. This is a a, a present tense, ongoing action. Our being made holy. Our being set. Our being sanctified. So this is the work that is completed on the cross. Now continues through all time. That's kind of a big deal. Very interesting picture. All right. Could, could I, uh, please? Just I figure you got all falls. What yeah. questions you got to get in here? I think I think this is a good time to make the point that the word there is not being justified, yeah, but rather sanctified. Yeah. And the sanctification takes place in reality the same way the justification does. Yes. It takes place when you say to me this morning. Your sins right. are forgiven right. by virtue of my office. It, it, when you preached that word of God that, that opened and exposed my sin, and you said that Christ had conquered that, and then when you gave to me the very body and blood of Christ for my sin, for the forgiveness of your sin, I think that's the exact word you used, mm -hmm. given for you. Yep. Um, that is how I am also being sanctified not by what I do. Yeah. And, and I think that's where many people in Christendom lose sight of what's going on. Sanct sanctification is not a self-help program. <laughs> sanctification is not our part in the deal. Okay, God justifies me, now I have to make myself holy, now that God has sort of given me the divine kickstart. Um, that, but that this is that this is his work of sanctification, of making us whole. His continual work. Yeah. So was there another thing? Andy. After consulting with Pastor Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting out, for that. It turns out that an acceptable alternate translation for Christ's final words on the cross would be, it is perfected. It is perfected. Absolutely. That's, that puts it in a whole yeah, that is that is precisely that is the exact same word here to tell us die. Yeah. Yep, that is the exact same it's kind of cheating asking him though. No. I mean, <laughs> just saying. Sometimes I check before I open. Alright. Nice <laughs> <laughs> not even touching that. Alright. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. 
where there is forgiveness for, of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Couple, couple notes on this. Um, first of all, you can't read laws here as Ten Commandments. Okay, this is that. That's not. That's not what is meant here, or at least not exclusively that. This is that. I will. I will. We can almost translate. I will put my will on their hearts. Something, something like that. I will put my Torah on their on their hearts. I will put my complete revelation on their hearts. Pastor Meyer, please. I'll put Jesus on their hearts. I'll put Jesus on their heart. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. I like the Torah. Sounds of that. The personification of yeah. Torah is the Christ. Is Jesus. Yeah, that's it. I like that. I like that. So I will put Jesus on their hearts and, and write them, that is him, on their minds. And so, so you get this really interesting sort of sort of contrast here in, Jer in Jeremiah, which which the the author here highlights. Then he adds, "I will I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more." And this is uh, sometimes we we talk about in very um, very nice square systematic language. Uh, about God's uh, characteristics, you know that He's that He's all powerful, that He's all knowing. I've always I always kind of want to add to that 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 He is also forgetful. <laughs> that He is, uh, but all forgetting doesn't sound quite like a good characteristic of God. And yet there you have it. That God, re that God remembers our sins no more. And that, and that, of course, brings up um, all kinds of places in the scriptures, but particularly from the, from the Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Um, I, I would call this divine forgetfulness. Um, you know, we kind of live in a, in a time and in a place where um, sort of the, uh, having, a, having a perfect memory or having instant recall it's kind of the, the height of, that's, that's the goal. But um, I'm here to say that remembering things isn't always good. Right? And, um, and, and, and what God holds up for us here is that he does not remember our sins. That he cast them aside. And if God is going to cast them aside so that he no longer remembers our sins, guess what? Why am I holding on to them? <laughs> what is the point of that? When, when the creator of the universe doesn't remember them, why, is, why do I think it's so important to cling to these things? Barbara. There were some women in our life class that said it so well. She's beating herself over her sins and all the things that she'd done wrong, talking to God about it, and yep. he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, this, this notion of divine, divine forgetfulness. <laughs> you can ask the question, what's the difference between sins and lawlessness? And when you look at the whole passage, you have to remember, what was the chief problem with the people that Jerry was preaching against? Jerry. Jeremiah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was it? Sir, you know. Well, I can say these crossway students ought to be able to say it. Or, idolatry. Idolatry, that's right. Lawlessness. As you know, there's when you go after the other God, you no longer do his will, you no longer have Torah on their hearts. You have you're without that revelation. Without that revelation, then you are gonna go after the God of your own eyes. Then you are self willed leads to sins. Yeah, then you are self willed So you have this here, I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. 
I will remember their sins and their idolatry no more. Yeah. All those deeds that were part of idolatrous worship. Yep. Ada. Ada. Ada, please. I'm, I'm thinking about another passage that he says, I will count their sins no more. Yeah. It, is this an English uh, translation? Those are different. Those are different words. Those are different words, and obviously, you can kind of, you know, the count language has um, count or, or reckon. Sometimes you'll get that that kind of that kind of language. That um, and that and that gets behind the uh, the concept of of sin as debt. That sin is a debt that I owe, and and that God does not. Reckon or count these sins against me. And they're all forgiven. Right, they're all forgiven. And so that's. I can't see where. I mean, I can't see that he doesn't remember them. He doesn't remember them. I mean, it's a forgiveness. Yeah, well, and remember, forgiveness, of course. And, and I, I guess I would say that they are different. They are different pictures or different ways of thinking about the same thing. One way would be to say that 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 God God has these that that we have done these sins and God says these sins have now been applied to Jesus' account and so they are no longer counted against me, right? So that would be one way. Another way would be would be to say that that God does not does not hold to these sins or does not or does not. Put that in mind when he when he sees me. So think of it, for example, as <clears throat> since Walt is sitting in front of me. So imagine, for example, Walt has uh, walked outside and managed to get himself all covered in mud. And so I'm looking at Walt and thinking, Walt, you're a big mess, <laughs> right? Um, and <clears throat> and God looks at at this and says, I don't see any mess. I only see my child. I only see my beloved. Well, when you have, when you forgive death, it's erased. That's right, it's erased. So it is, it no longer exists. Right. Yeah. And then, which sounds a lot like forgetfulness to me as well. So yeah, I, 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 hear, I understand what you're saying. All right, I'm going to go on. Therefore, our favorite word. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold, the, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us continue, consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I don't know, there isn't that much to talk about there. <laughs> So, 19 and 20, we really get this, this high priest tabernacle picture here, right? Quite explicitly, if there's any possible question that, uh, that, of what he's getting at, he, he makes it very clear. Through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. <laughs> so, so, Jesus' flesh is the is the means through which we enter into the presence of God. That's it. And so he is both the sacrifice, the blood, and he is the curtain, the flesh, and he is the high priest. Right? So he is both the place where the sacrifice takes takes place, the temple, and he is the sacrifice, and he is the high priest that offers the sacrifice. It is all about Jesus. Whole thing, start to finish. Now, where do you recognize this line from? They offer to 
It does sound a little like Psalm 51, doesn't it? Create in me a clean heart, O God. There's another place that isn't, that is certainly true. That wasn't actually what I was thinking of. I was thinking of, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father. This, that is right out of our confession of sins liturgy. I mean, that is taken directly out of, uh, out of Hebrews 10 here. That let us draw near with a true heart language. Um, and then we get sprinkled clean and washed with pure, with pure water. Hmm. I wonder what that's talking about. Let's just say that the word wash is the word baptizo. Yes. So we sprinkle, he says. I am going to start next week at verse 19. And we will unpack this more because this is just such a such a fantastic section. I refuse to rush through it. No matter how much you want me to. Alright. And I hear the pitter-patter of voices and the uh, the uh, anxious cookie sellers in the uh, in the library or the second library or whatever we're calling that room. So we will close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen. Thank you, everyone.